to the most complicated and maybe the most important topic that we <coughs> cover these days, which is low power system design. And every one of those 45 companies I just mentioned, they are puzzled with how can we deploy thousands or millions of devices and, uh, and without having to employ thousands and millions of people to go change batteries and all of those kind of things. That's really a very important question. So, and we all know, I guess, who have gathered that <coughs> This is not about you know, a, a one-trick pony kind of thing. This is how you maximize everything that relates to your product towards consuming very little energy and or making more energy out of what you do. You know? But one way or another, you have to make your thing last for a long time. So we had three speakers <laughs> for today, and two of them got sick as of today. It's quite boring, so this is why my introduction is a little slow. <laughs> Very boring, but slow. No, but I'm so happy to, to tell you that we have two, two new speakers anyway. So, so we, we have a good evening tonight. And the first speaker will be somebody I cried to, basically, this afternoon at 5 o'clock. I said, no, I need your help. Because you know, I guess when, if you are making drones that flies into caves and all that kind of stuff, you must have been thinking a lot about you know, how to do this without spending all your energy in the beginning of the cave. So I called Pau, a good friend here, founder of Inconova, and said, uh, can you help me with it? Said, sure, of course. I can probably talk for weeks about that. So our first speaker is Pau Malone, the founder of Inconova, a very good friend of mine. And, and you know, it's all yours. And I said to him, you can talk about anything you like. <laughs> they will like it anyway. So take it away. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so good afternoon, or it, yeah, almost evening, I guess. Um, as Manuel said, uh, my name is Pamelo, and uh, I'm um, a founder and CEO of uh, Econova. Um, I want to start um, by uh, clarifying and put this out of the way. This is not a low power system. <laughs> so, but it's interesting that actually uh, when Magnus told me about uh, speaking tonight, um, and I knew about the event, but I thought, okay, that's not wrong for us. Uh, but when he talked uh, about, uh, as he said, a healthy thing or, or presenting, I thought, actually, actually, it's not a low power system, but it's very important that actually we try to spend as little power as possible. Because we put our systems, our drones, um, in inaccessible areas underground. Uh, in mines, for example, or tunnels, um, and we want to maximize the flight time um, because we need to have protections and you know, you know like a drone that flies outside. There is a lot of <coughs> dead mass in covers and so on, and that means that the flight time is very, very reduced. So I thought actually it's not, it's not as I said, a low power system. Every every of these motors can deliver two kilowatts, so you can it's like a four kilowatt uh, uh, system kind of almost. 
Um, but nevertheless, uh, what I what is true is that we had we have been developing drones for a long time, and uh, we always uh, struggled to get uh, um, kind of relevant flight time uh, because of all these uh, accessories that I was mentioned. So um, I wanted to talk about. I'm going to just go through a bit of what we do, by the way, so that uh, I think it's can be interesting or a bit curious. But then I will basically. Um, talk briefly about um, some of our uh, um, uh, development hurdles when we try to actually minimize the, the, <coughs> the energy that we spend. So yeah, I wanted to clarify that, but I think still it's going to be hopefully interesting. Um, <coughs> so basically, um, and I'm going to go pr pretty quick, but as I mentioned, we specialize on 3D laser mapping in accessible areas um, underground uh, or dangerous areas where people cannot go. Um, this is, for example, um, uh, the beginning of a scope. So it's accessible until no. This actually is probably not accessible anymore, but until where the picture was taken. And what the clients want is to actually get data about the, the areas after blasting or, or <coughs> that has been some accident or. <coughs> Uh, stones uh, just came down. So basically, um, we carry, we have developed drones. This is uh, the last prototype. Right now, we are building our commercial unit. But basically, these are drones that carry a, a lidar, a 3D laser scanner, and a computer on the back. Which again, it's pretty powerful, but we need to need to to work to minimize the, the, the energy consumed. And we bring the the laser scanner through with the drone, obviously, uh, inside these areas, and then with 3D laser map. So this is uh, not completed, but that's the commercial unit for which looks much more covered and so on. And as I mentioned, if you have, if you're familiar with drones like DJI and other drones, uh, uh, commercial drones, usually are a couple of arms in, in a cross or, or yeah, and a little body in the middle. Um, still, some can carry relatively high payloads, but uh, in our case, we have to protect against dust, against water, uh, many things. And dust, not just the dust itself, but uh, again, ferromagnetic dust that in iron mines, like in iron mines, is pr particularly uh, tricky. So we have a lot of extra, uh, a, lot of, a lot of issues when it comes to energy consumption. Um, so basically, um, yeah, this is just another picture of, going into a shaft, a very tiny shaft, actually. Yeah, just foldability. I'm going to go through this, a bit of dimensions. This is actually, for example, one of our latest uh, 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 scans in Kazakhstan. Um, just to give you an idea, we, the actual flight time to scan all this, and this is about 100 meters, so for these places, <coughs> they go tracks inside, just to give you an idea of the size. Uh, this took about uh, less than one hour, uh, uh, about one hour uh, actual flight time. And all this was made through uh, using this drone, actually. This is a detail of this area here. That's just a detail of, uh, uh, of the laser scanner, uh, of the, the, the laser map uh, scan. And this is just with uh, some another type of uh, shadowing and, and cut, so you can see inside uh, all the stones and so on. So all this was inaccessible, so we had to fly here. Um, yeah, and this is another case where we had to actually <coughs> scan all this and we could, could only uh, stay here. This is about five meters tall, so that we get the, 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 the proportions and similar here. This is a typical drift, sorry. Typical drift uh, size, and until here was accessible, and all this they had to know this the shape and so on. So um, I think that's interesting that um, <coughs> we actually did all these in, in about five minutes uh, flight. Uh, so pretty, pretty. Uh, even though it's a big space, the lidar gets 50, 60 meters, so you don't really need to go to the end anyway. But there are blind spots where <coughs> you really go into. So uh, let's, and that's yeah the process, how it works, so it's flying, landing, getting the data, and then you can clean and remove people, remove ghost points and georeferencing. Uh, yeah, just a bit, this is more, more oriented to actual clients. So, a bit of plan. 
So basically, um, this is what we do. And um, now I'm going to talk about uh, a bit about um, all the, the issues that we had when it comes to consumption. So um, traditionally, drones of this size, they can fly about 30, 40 minutes easy. Um, they have a relatively high efficiency. And obviously, among other things, because they are pretty light, <coughs> have a minimum structure. So in our case, we had always uh, had issues um, because of all these uh, covers and so on. So um, we have tried many things uh, over the years. We have actually um, uh, had our own uh, test bench and test a lot of, uh, all comes out, comes out to the motor propeller uh, combination actually, uh, provided that you, don't, you cannot change the actual weight of the system. So um, we came, we went from uh, having internal tests with the thrust test bench and trying to optimize uh, control parameters of the motors. Um, the, the control of the motors can, <coughs> can be actually um, uh, adjusted in certain, uh, certain aspects. Uh, that could actually, that gave some, some, uh, some uh, extra efficiency. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, in the past uh, a custom motor also trying to actually get something that was matching our, our application. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that over the years, um, the manufacturers themselves has, have actually started um, taking more seriously about providing uh, complete solutions, M motor, uh, controller, and motor uh, propeller combinations. So, um, one of the one of the big advantages, obviously, is that the, they have spent all the money and development to to find out these uh, these combos. So, what we are doing nowadays uh, is actually um, trying to uh, not to reinvent the wheel. Nowadays, uh, luckily for us, when it comes to drone technology, has uh, there is a lot of off the shelf quality and efficient components. Um, so, my my take here is that. Um, which I guess is pretty <coughs> obvious, but unless, unless one is starting in a, an area which is not really mature uh, and has to develop uh, um, and work on the software and hardware themselves, um, it's obviously pretty efficient uh, to try to use uh, what is already in the market and other shelf components. Um, we actually we couldn't do this at the beginning. Uh, as I said, we have to customize a lot of components. But uh, luckily, technology, uh, drone technology in our case, has been developing quite well. Uh, I don't know about other type of uh, systems that, um, that uh, the people is here involved in. But um, yeah, so I hope that, uh, that some of you have uh, off-the-shelf solutions that can actually help on minimizing the consumption. Because it's a lot of, a lot of work, obviously, too, uh, with the startups and we are five people, we were three some time ago, so it's pretty demanding to try to develop your own motors when you have some other things to develop anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was probably not 100% aligned with uh, the topic, but uh, still it's relevant that we need to minimize, make our systems as efficient as possible, even though they are not actually low power systems, uh, strictly speaking. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That was a bit um, about my presentation. If there is any question or yeah, <coughs> yeah. What kind of computing power do you have on uh, on your drone? We use uh, an Intel Nuke. Um, so we one of the oh, high high one of the top line i7. We used in <coughs> the latest uh, CPUs, 16 gigas RAM and you know um, relatively powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, but that's a good question actually because the latest model that uh, the commercial unit uh, <coughs> that this this uh, scanning drone is, is is having, we saw that actually they went from 60 to 80 watts uh, requirement nominal uh, maximum power. So we have to change regulators. Uh, we have a big regulator up there, but this new <coughs> is from the uh, generation seven, I think, and now we are using generation eight, which is more. It goes from 60 to 80 watts. Uh, yeah, let's start here and go back. Yeah, is the scanner so fast, 
So it doesn't make sense to land occasionally to scan, or I mean, if you're going very far, I would just imagine you go 20 meters and you scan, and you go 10, 20 meters. It's uh, the thing is that imagine that there has been an earthquake. Oh yeah, yeah. You need to scan the ground and figure out where to land, of course. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Basically, there is no way to land. <laughs> okay. So the, um, no, that's a good question. Um, this is a very good example. So even though this looks pretty flat. Actually, in all this area, this was accessible. Only, sorry, until here, more or less. Okay, we can hear. Only this was accessible. So, on all this area, I we only found uh, like a, literally like a one square meter area where it was not only flat but relatively horizontal. So it's uh, extremely complicated to land uh, as soon as, especially because if you land and there is a stone or something uh, touching a propeller, uh, it will not start spinning. It has very low torque at the beginning. So like you mentioned that if you while you are landing you can already break it. So it's no this you we shouldn't um, we we'll never expect to land. Um, so. mm. Mm? That's okay. How many lasers do you use? Excuse me. How many lasers? This is a this is a uh, It's a sixteen channel sixteen lasers uh, that scan. Uh, I mean it spins completely. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a uh, sixteen uh, lasers. Uh, Two degrees uh, apart. Sorry, oh, what, yeah, two de one degree apart or something like this. Um, the field of view is plus minus 15, so 13 mm -hmm. degrees. It's a typical um, uh, lighter that uh, was. Th this form factor is suitable for automo automotive and terrestrial, but in order to. So it, get, it, it has a relatively low field of view, um, but if you, we spin it in a perpendicular axis, then we get the 360 real time mm -hmm. and um, but now that you mention um, I'm going to wait a lot of points per second this can provide up to 600,000 points per second mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show a quick video I'm going to go quick uh, because I think <coughs> it's interesting to see how, how we have gone from <coughs> so basically this is um, a new line of sight uh, navigation so basically this is the drone okay and flying line of sight, that is fine. Usually for outside line of sight, people use FPV cameras, which is a camera on the drone that stands down the video, right? Uh, but we don't do that, actually, anymore. Uh, what we do is we stream down in real time the, the, LiDAR, uh, the LiDAR data. This is the, the, the actual 3D laser scanner. It, now this model is, is not rotating, that's just a drone. And the interesting thing is that we can actually, in real time, with the mouth, we can just rotate and see from different perspectives. So you can see, you can fly as operator, seeing the drone from a bit behind, and see all what is around. So this is what we are actually nowadays doing, and that's as I said, video line of sight. But this is two drones, one one filming the other. No, 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 <coughs> no, no. This is so one. How, how, are you, how are you filming the, the drone? Or no, no. We are because this is a 3D model in the computer that is generated in real time. <laughs> so you can actually zoom out. I will show you. I don't have it here actually. Yeah. But basically, as soon as this is a, in this case the the, the perspective was fixed. Um, so now and then I show that now from there and then from here. So. Is it flying by itself or? No, not this one. Uh, it has uh, some, it has position, some concept <coughs> needs, uh, has position hole, meaning that the drone, uh, we use a SLAM, uh, and then uh, with the SLAM uh, uh, you can actually localize uh, yourself in the environment. So the drone, if you let the sticks, the drone stays there. So it's not flying on its own yet, we have plans very soon to, we are working actually on that, but uh, um, we, we still provide, just we tell the drone go back, forth, back and forth, right, left, up and down. But it's super easy to do. This is a screenshot of the computer. What sensors do you have on board? Because I... Oof, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. We have... Uh, Which one don't you have? Sorry? Which one don't you have? Uh, we don't have... Uh, sonars? No, it's, we are missing sonars. Uh, we don't have cameras uh, in this sense. So we use, we have the, the, the LiDAR, which is a sensor actually, then. 
Uh, we have uh, um, nine degrees of ten degrees of freedom IMU for just the scanning part mm -hmm. to help on that on the uh, on the attitude of the scanner itself. We have another ten degrees of freedom IMU in the flight controller itself, meaning nine plus manometer, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we have an encoder in the servo, and, and then we have current sensors and things in the for the power system, the <coughs> units, one the voltage voltage. So, yeah. so, so when you turn around in the cave and, and you, in order to overwrite the, or not to overwrite the data, you, you just improve the accuracy of what you saw, right? Yes. So is that made by the sensor accuracy or is it like the graphic that you fetch, that you interpolate that in the no, computer? No, that's a SLAM. The, we use a SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, yeah. which is, a SLAM is actually a humming, it's like saying a car, you know, there are many types of cars. Uh, we use a SLAM, uh, <coughs> and what the SLAM does in this case, which there are many types, <coughs> in this case what uh, the SLAM does is it detects features, that's why it's, it's very good in our environment because there are no, no actually uh, two sections of the area that is the same, it's not, like, it's not like here that there are, that in a flat wall you don't know if you are, uh, it's more problematic. <coughs> so it detects features and by every scan rate, uh, sky frame, it matches uh, the, right. the, the features with respect to the previous ones. So mm -hmm. it has odometry. So in this way, you can actually have a, yeah, there is an odometry model obviously in the, in the code mm -hmm. that uh, tracks the movement of the drone within uh, the environment. So that's why, that's why, and this data that I, I, I was showing, actually, unfortunately, my guys uh, are not here, otherwise we could see show in real time, um, but uh, the, the repeating when uh, was the question, so we stream down the, the data of the environment plus the position of the scanner mm -hmm. slash drone within the environment, and this is visualized. So this data is a 3D model, like any other 3D model in computer, computer that you can zoom in and out. So you can actually zoom out and you would see the scan area from outside. Right. Or, or really go zoom in and, and be like like sitting in the room. You choose the perspective as you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. Um, but <coughs> if you're streaming data back and doing the computation from the computer, why do you have such a big computer on the drone? No, no, no. That's a, that's actually maybe I uh, I didn't explain this correctly. All the computation is uh, is done in the computer in the room. What? Because uh, we want to actually uh, not to rely on uh, powerful ground stations, for example. Um, and uh, we want to actually have uh, on board uh, autonomous features that are coming soon. So we need to really process. It's kind of a feature-proof uh, system, meaning that we can keep adding things. Right now, we are running at 50% uh, CPU uh, at full load. So we have uh, plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, room for just a big software updates that provides fancy autonomous and <coughs> uh, we, we process in parallel also all the data so when when um, when we land we just download the, the file we are the only ones even our competitors don't do that we just had two weeks ago a test with a service company that brought our competitors uh, system uh, and yeah so it was very interesting to see that we landed and we downloaded the data and we saw the model on, on the spot we had to wait for their data 45 minutes to be processed to actually create a um, 3D model that would be seen in a computer. <coughs> so it's, it's important for us to have a system uh, that is self, uh, you can do whatever with this, basically. But it's very power hungry. <coughs> Sorry? But it's very power hungry, I guess. Yeah, as I said, it's rated at 80 watts, this one, but uh, compared with uh, almost two kilowatts of the whole drone system, mm -hmm. so in, in ratio, it's, it's not, it's just removing like Seconds by time or 15 seconds. So, not that. Not that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What, what wireless uh, technology are you controlling? Uh, we are using 2.4 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my guys don't, don't like me to call it Wi Fi. Wi Fi? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually, they, they are right. It's not the Wi Fi that we have at home. We have uh, MIMO technologies and some beamforming, fancy stuff. Uh, it's actually a pretty powerful uh, AP. So we, we create a point-to-point -point network between the drone, uh, which is right, yeah, the commercial unit 
all is in the same, in the same box, but that's the, that's all, our own case, obviously. <laughs> uh, but that's the, because the, the default case is super heavy. Um, so yeah, it's 2.4 gigahertz with some fancy proprietary modulation thing. What, what kind of accuracy do you get when you fly hundreds of meters as you showed? I mean, are, are we talking, obviously it's enough, but is it meters or centimeters or what the you... Accuracy of what? Localization or the mapping, mapping geometry? Uh, the, the mapping, I mean, how Does accurate is the distance if you've flown 500 meters? You have no other reference than your own slam, right? Yeah, yeah, but, but uh, the system is scanning on its own and it's, mm -hmm. it has saved all the previous data. So, uh, basically, what, what the accuracy you get is, is the inst instantaneous accuracy. You get it all through all the flight. So the slam... Yeah, yeah but for every ca angle, you will have a small calculation error, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you go 500 meters, variable. that must be... It doesn't matter how far you go. Are you talking about drift, you mean? Look okay. closer drift, are you talking about that? I mean, if you, if you say from here it's 284 meters, mm -hmm. how accurate is that? Ah, okay. <coughs> so not that we fly far away, rather than if we are scanning something that is far away from the drone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the angular resolution I think is 0 0.05. It's easy to check. Is a Velodyne uh, DLP16. Uh, so I think it's it's 0 0.05 degrees. I think in angular resolution something like this. It's pretty. Um, I don't remember the no, details. No, it doesn't matter. I mean, but the arrows will add up the longer you go. That's mm -hmm. my point. Right? Yeah, but <coughs> since you are moving, I mean, if you are still, the, the you, it's true, at, at 50 meters, you are going to have probably, I don't know, maybe several centimeters mm -hmm. between the points, but you are moving. So the, the space that you have in a single frame is going to be filled by others. Yes, yeah, okay. Now, uh, we're not talking we're not talk about the same problem, but okay, that's fine. So that's I, fine. I, I understood wrong. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, we can, you can explain, I mean, can yeah. talk after the presentation. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. No. No. <laughs> when, when we talk about one, two, there are a few of you. So I made part one being a, a, a very big part of that was a case study where we discussed a something that I couldn't reveal exactly what it was, but it was something that's spinning and it's outside and it senses um, different things. <laughs> and, and it reports to a, to a gateway and up to the cloud. And they, they each sensor, which are a battery operator, they are, um, they are required to live for 20 years on a battery, on a primary battery cell. So that was the case study that I presented to. And that was an extreme low power design of this. Uh, today I will present the second part of this, which is um, addressing low power systems from another perspective. So I, I think I will cover many, not all of course, but many reasons for a low power system. When we talk about low power system, there, will, there would be a few of the projects that have to do this because of regulatory requirements. There would be many projects that have to be battery operated and they have requirements as with the case study that I presented last time uh, <coughs> have a requirement for a very long lifetime on battery so that being said they need to be low power and then there are thermal aspects and IoT we're, we're talking very much IoT in this building but we are um, IoT for most people are like well a sensor a small sensor out there that, that sends data from something up to cloud and one person can remote we monitor that. Something. But IoT is much more than that. IoT is really internet of things. Everything that gets access to internet that can autonomously upload data, sense data, do something with data, that's an IoT device. And, and if you agree on that definition, there would be many, many IoT devices out there that could have potential displays, that could potentially have a user interface. And then the thermal aspects are becoming really a big thing. So I will cover most of my presentation on that area. Um, first of all, the regulatory reasons. There are, equidesign is a typical requirement where, where if you have a television where, with a um, power adapter to it, and the television set is set in standby. There are requirements that the power adapter, including the device, the TV, 
must not uh, consume more than 500 milliwatts in standby. This is the definition of the equity sign, and you can then have a logo, nice and fancy logo, <coughs> on your device. This is crucial for, for some uh, products, for some business areas. The other one is the safety regulations, uh, ESC 16950.1, uh, stating a lot of safety aspects from products. This is also defining thermal aspects. So if you have a device that you can touch, if you can hold whatever this device, if it's made of metal and you can hold it where you, it, you, it's intended to be held, it must never exceed 55 degrees Celsius in your hand. Um, if you touch it for some time, but then the normal use case is like you touch it and then you leave it, it might get 50 by degrees, uh, 60 degrees. And then if you touch it by occasion, by, mm, it's not intended to be touched, but you, there's nothing preventing it from getting touched. You can be something like 65, 70 -ish degrees Celsius. And this is before you get burned. If the device is made of plastic, uh, you have 75 degrees Celsius, it's acceptable for you to, to hold it in your hand. Um, and if you, are touching it like more like irregularly, it can be 85 degrees Celsius. And if you intentionally or unintentionally touches it, but you're not intended to hold it, then it can be even up to 95 degrees Celsius. And the thing is, plastic have so much worse thermal uh, effects when the, the conductance between your hand and the plastic thing are worse than metal. Now these are regulatory aspects, and, and for, for some devices you are not allowed to, to generate more power because you're, you're intended to hold this in your hand. And this is important to keep in mind when you, when you do consumer electronics, but also professional tools. So if we start with better operated device with long, longevity. <coughs> um, operating conditions, the, these are things that you need to consider. Now I am presenting a mixture of things to consider before you do a selection or a decision, and also things to consider when you have made a decision. So operating conditions, um, what is the expected longevity? Of course, then that have direct effect on, should I have a rechargeable battery? Should I have a, a primary cell that I have to replace when it's empty? Um, is it 20 years or is it like five years or are we talking months? Um, the operating temperature have direct effect on the battery capacity itself. So some battery technology would not uh, work well below zero degrees Celsius uh, or high temperature as well. Is energy harvesting possible? Then that would for sure give you totally other um, possibilities in, in using a battery, like keeping the, the peak current consumption um, managed, but then the, the energy harvesting would manage the, or the, the uh, suspend power. This is very important. When you talk about system topology, is this doing native execution or do you do something in cloud? We'll cover this later as well, but it's really, the essence is, are you doing computation on the device? Or do you save or store sensor data and upload that to the cloud and do the rest of the processing in the cloud? Uh, the functionality split then, what is done on the device and what is done in the back? And this is something that you need to decide in an early stage, because this has the effect on <coughs> what radio technology should you implement, what is the radio protocol, how much memory should you use? Do you need to have a, a huge processing power? Do you need a DSP or not? So this is important. And then the connectivity, as I mentioned. Do you need connectivity? Probably, because this is IoT. You're uploading data, but should it be very low power, like low, and, and, and low data bandwidth systems, like LoRa, Sigfox, which are we talking narrowband IoT? The type of system, this is, also very important, but it's, it, it's kind of a given. Are you doing a toy? Then it's acceptable that it doesn't work as well. It might consume more battery than it was stated on the box. Probably most people wouldn't care that much. But if it's a life supporting system, for sure, they would care if the battery is drained and fairly fine. <coughs> Sensors versus system controller. This is also important when you talk IT. Is it a pure sensor that sends the temperature somewhere out there? Or is this a system controller, which is maybe my my case from a case study from last time? Uh, 
the, the system controllers resides in the part of the thing <laughs> and the things that spin around uh, they are the sensors and the sensors would run on battery but the, the system controller might actually run on mains or a battery or both depending on scenarios schedule of data transactions for sure if you send data once a day or every minute that have a huge effect on, on power consumption again these are things that you might be able to, to um, control and define in an early stage of the project but if you have a given spec you just have to live and accept what it says so these are one of the things that we are talking very much about do this cycle is key when it comes to low power systems if you transmit once a day for a very short period of time and possibly some event during the day happens and you transmit that as well right? then you can for sure live for 20 years on a, on a Bluetooth long range device uh, but if you're transmitting every hour, then, then you will have a few, li a, a few years, maybe, lifetime of that battery. Battery technology. Uh, as I mentioned, there are batteries that can give 20 years of battery. There are batteries that will not support below 20 degrees, uh, below 0 degrees Celsius. Uh, rechargeable batteries. Uh, they normally, lithium batteries, are not allowed to get charged under, under 0 degrees Celsius, which means that in many applications in IT where you have a sensor that are it doesn't necessarily have to be outdoor it could be in, a, in an environment where the temperature during winter can be below zero but it's still inside a building um, computation complexity we were into that is it native algorithms on the device or doing edge AI or cloud AI this is extremely popular right now when we talk to many of our uh, partners in our networks that, that are working with Edge AI. And the reason for Edge AI is, of course, that you can do a lot more processing and communication consumes power. Um, computation consumes less power in many scenarios, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best and given solution for any case. Um, yeah. Then thermal aspects. I am working together with a, a customer of ours right now on a device which is an IT device. It's not the typical, typical device that you think of an IT. It has a display, it has a user interface, people are interacting with the device, it connects to the internet, it has sensors, um, and I won't tell you more than that, but uh, a lot of these comments and, and inputs comes from that specific project actually. Um, again, operating temperature. Are we doing a device that should run on battery? Yeah, it's on battery, but it's not on its own battery. It's on someone else's battery. So we can consume a lot of power because you would drain that battery. And, and if you drain that battery, you're, it, it's a bad scenario. Um, the installation and enclosure is extremely important to understand. So is, again, temperature is the installation and enclosure um, making the device uh, always reside above zero degrees Celsius and in this case not um, is the installation or the enclosure made of plastics or metal because you would touch this device but it's um, it's not intended to keep in your hand but you would as a natural use of it touch the device um, this system, this system is graphic, and graphical system, we'll come back to that, because graphical system adds yet a, a, a huge complication right now. The people are expecting to have high resolution pictures or, or displays. People are expecting to have high frame rate when you see graphics, and you wouldn't come away with having a poor flow. If you, if you swipe on a touchscreen and, and the picture is like, that is totally unacceptable today. And um, I think we'll pause there and we'll come back to that. And uh, connectivity method, again, um, when it comes to thermal aspects, uh, LTE modem consumes a lot more, more power, or even a 3G modem would consume a lot of power. Um, Narrowband IT is much better. If you look on Bluetooth long range, it's extremely low power. And there are different technologies out there. So what is useful in this kind of product 
And this is valid for any reasoning about any project, even if I talk about a specific project in mind right now. Um, so when you decide connectivity method, it's a lot of um, thinking behind, do I need to connect directly to the internet? Do I have an access point somewhere in close by? Is it an open standard? Or am I allowed to connect to Wi-Fi or a proprietary Wi-Fi network or a generic well, office network? Who is the intended user? Is it a consumer, professional, or remote control service? This is also very interesting when you talk low power. If it's a consumer device, you buy a device, and I bought it, I can possibly replace the battery. I can possibly live with that the battery time is less than it said on the box. This is what we see at Waller almost every day. Uh, if it's a professional device, you would expect that the spec is that the device is better than the spec, or at least as good as the spec. If it's a remote controlled service, this is probably also related. It doesn't necessarily have to, but it's probably related to that you have a business model where you actually pay for a service. And someone or you are monitoring your system from remote. It could be like you pay for mm -hmm, as a service. And, and then, of course, the whole business model would get ruined if you don't have connection. Uh, again, when it comes to the thermal aspects, holding, touching, or do you use gloves or bare hands? This is very important. Uh, and that now comes down to, okay, so if, you, if you, you know that you should hold the device, what do I need to think about that? I can make it plastic, okay. It's a high-end device, I would like to have it metal, but I need to go plastic, I understand that. Next thing I have to think of, what is the user interface? If I have a user interface which, which is video or, or imaging or graphics in some way, um, what kind of information should I give on this user interface? Because the user interface will generate heat, I'm sure. It will consume power, I'm sure. So at an early stage, we need to define what is our user interface, the graphical part of the user interface, and what does it, what it have to be, and what is nice to have. Um, we have a full behavior then to, we can always share information on the user interface saying the device is too hot or the, the battery is getting drained. And the, we can make the user aware of this scenario. So that's a full behavior that we can manage. Um, if you have a system shutdown, that might be okay in a consumer device or professional device maybe, remote control service, then we might have a big problem. Part of it, because it's part of your business model, Part of it is because you might have to go out and service this device. Uh, replacing batteries would take someone getting into a car, driving to that state, changing the battery, and, and you are just burning money. Uh, industrial process stop is really severe. This is where, where money are, are really running. And uh, just ex thinking of if this would be a aluminium smelt bag, melting metal. The cost for that kind of process, if you stop that for one hour, is huge. Um, and okay, so in that case, you're probably not looking for low power systems because they are low power and running on battery. They are probably running on mains or some heavy battery. But it still might be that it's a device that you hold in your hand and it might, must not get too hot. So you, you're going into low power because of that thermal aspect. And then this is really important. You, you must not have this scenario. Um, part of the risk analysis would be, is there injuries? Yes, heat will generate or could generate blisters. It could generate more than that. Uh, if you have some heat building up in a device, it can potentially explode. So you need to think about exploding devices. What if my lithium ion battery gets too hot? What happens then? Um, uncomfortably, yeah, for sure. Uh, and then legislations and liability. This is, of course, the safety, all the safety aspects. <coughs> if I now concluded that I need a display on my device, uh, I need a user interface or a GUI, um, I need to address my customers that up today are using smartphones, 
Uh, everyone understands that 1080p is a minimal resolution. S doesn't matter if the display is like this on the and the pin. It's it's just a requirement. You can't get around it. 720p is low resolution. Period. <laughs> so okay, so we have a higher resolution, but that would get us higher system load. We also have a higher frame rate. Uh, everyone expects 60 frames per second of the video, even though 30 frames per second is totally sufficient. If you look on a, a TV film or an old video, that is 24 frames per second. You can actually m maybe see that once in a while, but 30 frames per second is sufficient. But if you have a touch screen on the device, if you are touching the device and there, there, there is a, I worked 30 years with smartphone development and during that time, there was a huge buzz about user feedback timing. 30 to 40 milliseconds is the maximum time you're allowed to take between doing something, interacting with the device until you get some feedback on that interaction. And if it takes like 50, 60, 70 milliseconds, the user will like already have started to, to tap it again. And then it became this, like my father always said, it doesn't work. <laughs> and and for the 30, 40, 50 millisecond, really, is where it got. And if you have 30 frames per second, the time between two frames is 33 milliseconds. So already at 30 frames per second, if you touch the device and swipe on the touch screen, you're already late. Presenting the next slide. So you need to take 60 frames per second to get a, a feeling that you have a fresh user interface on the device. Okay, system load. CPU, <coughs> or uh, sorry, GPU versus software rendering. This is now, now it's get complicated. Um, and this is where, for the specific project that I'm relating to, we started off with a wide VGA display. Um, we have a CPU, an application processor running Linux. It has four CPU cores, each running on 1.6 gigahertz. It's a huge amount of processing power. And the software guys started to play around with, uh, first of all, we, we, we had this discussion, what kind of rendering system would you have? Should you have web engine? Should you have Qt native or, or um, WebGL, it was an option. And the conclusion were, by different reasons, that we should use web engine. That's a really high abstraction layer. You, you, got, uh, you, you generate the graphics through HTML5. And web engine is so heavy on the system load, and since that processor did not support a, a graphical accelerator, there was no 3G GPU. So there is no OpenGL ES API. And these guys are relying on OpenGL ES. And without that, everything had to be done in software, and you couldn't manage. Four, four cores, 1.6 gigahertz per each, and you can't manage to do a swipe and a nice flowy GUI on a wide VJ display. Lazy programmers. <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem that everyone sees because the trend is so clear. Everyone wants to do things on higher abstraction layer. And of course, HTML5 graphics, nice for everyone, except for the guys that have to fill all this processing power from the, from the bottom up and supply that CPU with, with power that generates heat. Okay, so in, in this worst case scenario that we ended up with, we needed to change the application process to something that in, includes GPUs. And of course, doing graphics and GPUs would actually reduce, significantly reduce the processing, uh, the, the, the power consumed during this processing. And then of course, we get this OpenGL ES API mm -hmm. and the graphics run smoothly and everything is there, except from that the GPU adds cost. So we had to pay like one and a half, two dollars more for the product, which was not on the in business case. And now we're touching the outer skirts of, can we really do this product? Now we're, it's not that obvious anymore. <coughs> and we're running Linux, so we are running DDR memories and, and it's already an expensive platform. This, I, I urge you to, when, you, when you're doing things with graphics, please consider, when you, when you talk about GPU, you, there is an option. You can run graphics on, on pure software on the CPU, but you shouldn't go this web engine way. You, there are ways to do graphics on, on a more like lower level. 
And I, I think that everyone that makes graphical user interface need to consider that. Type of display then. Okay, so we OLED so for sure is the best from, from thermal aspects, from power consumption aspects, but not from cost aspects. So OLED, every pixel illuminates itself. So if, if you have a dark background on the pixel on the display, uh, there will be like zero current consumption. And then as soon as you lit this pixel up, it consumes more and more. So you can design your graphical user interface like being a dark one with white text, and that would be quite low power. But if you have a backlit TFT, the backlight would be 100% on, or you can adopt the backlight to the ambient light, but it's on for all pixels, and then the pixels are opening or closing. Uh, from cost perspective, most guys end up here. All that's are expensive and they are not available for, for all dimensions. Uh, transmissive, transpective displays, again, from if you look on where this device will be used, is it an outdoor device that has direct sunlight on it? You might actually use the reflection in, in the display. So you use a transpective display. You don't have to have full backlight on because you can rely on the sun, sunlight making the good reflections. Maybe a little worse colors, but yeah, it, it's good. It's low power. It's considerably less power than if you have a transmissive display that you always have this backlight on because in direct sunlight you need to boost that power quite much. Uh, this is one thing that I, again, 13 years within Sony Ericsson, we started with displays that had its own uh, frame memory. There was a frame buffer memory in the display, display module. And for most smartphones, if you look on a phone, um, the only thing that is updated when it just when you hold it in your hand is the clock. And if you if you would like to present seconds, that will consume more power than just presenting minutes on the phone. Therefore, most most uh, I think Android is always showing minutes as a minimum. That is a static user, a static picture. You don't have any graphics rendering going on whatsoever. You generate that picture once every minute, you store it in a memory, and then that memory is, over the data from that, the frame buffer, is transferred over the memory uh, display interface up to the display panel at 60 frames per second, consuming power from the DRAM interface, consuming power from the graphical pipeline in the application processor, and then of course in the display. So in the early days of displays for smartphones, uh, you transfer that picture data to the frame buffer in the display, and then you could go, the whole graphical system in the application process could go standby. Until the next minute, when you change this minute digit, and then you, you update that frame buffer, transfer that to the, bis, uh, to the uh, frame buffer in the display unit, and then you go back to sleep again for one minute. But from cost perspective, this is not realistic anymore because now all the displays are 1080p or even 4K displays on smartphones. Again, this is something that you could look for because there are still small displays out there with built-in memory. Uh, I think I touched already on that one. UX model, visual only, multimodal, visual voice, etc., or sensors to assist UI. Sensors to assist you right. Typically that would be the ambient light sensor. If you have an ambient light sensor that states that now it's very very light, you need to increase the backlight intensity to, to make the display readable. Or vice versa, in, in, a, in a car in a night time, you should reduce this, the backlight significantly so you don't blend the, the user. That's typically one very good sensor. There are other sensors that could be used for motion detection is the environment, let's say that you're in a car, is the car moving or not? That might give you an idea of whether there is a person in the car or not. Should you even present the user interface or should you just close down the display? The power might be onto the system, but you're not presenting anything because sensors telling that there is nobody there. Um, so, last slide. If you go and look for tips and recommendations from, from, from a thermal aspect again, 
do not over specify the graphical UI paradigm. This is not only framework, but it's do you have do you have to have jumping rabbits on the display, or can you live with one frame updated once a minute? Do you need to present seconds, or is it okay to just present minutes? Um, when you slide a uh, uh, tiddle, when you slide the, the, the touch screen of your smartphone, you render pictures or the, the, the graphics from, from one position all the way through to the next position, and then it gets static again. The peak current is consumed during that transition where you generate the, the, the new renderings, and then it goes back to almost zero again. If possible, use all the displays, for sure, any day when you can. Uh, Influence sensors to adopt to luminance of the ambient light, and this is mainly if you don't have an OLED display. If possible, select a system controller with a GPU. It costs money, but it consumes less power, and it enables you to do all this fancy stuff. Um, this is touching upon a little bit the, the first session I had last time. Use DC-DCs rather than LDOs. A dc DCs today have a typically 93, 95 percent efficiency. What an LDO, if you're you, anything between the input voltage and the output voltage, you just burn that. You just waste that energy totally. So a DC, DC is much better in, in any aspects. It's a little bit bigger, it consumes more space, a little bit more expensive, uh, a bit more noisy. So from EMC perspective, it, it makes you, you have to be more aware of how you design this to pass type approval, but yeah. From software, if there is no GPU, careful selection of render. Should you really go web engine? No, try not to. You can do nice and fancy graphics without a GPU, but don't use web engine. <laughs> um, WebGL is something that comes right now very strong, and WebGL is much more on the lower level. You can probably come along with web engine graphics without GPU. And balance the system performance after the application. That most application processors using Linux will support DDFS, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. So depending on the system load, you change the voltage to the core, and you change the clocks of frequency. This is already supported by Linux. So if you have an application processor supporting DDFS, run in Linux, that's for sure the best way to go. And then mechanical. Aluminum transfer heat better than plastic. We've touched upon that several times. Be careful when you design this device. How should it be used? Should you keep it in your hand? Okay, so can I make it plastic? Or otherwise I need to take all these heavy decisions to go lower and lower and lower power just because of these heat issues. Um, yeah. I can skip that. So, this is a new way of thinking IoT for sure. I, I guess most of you are thinking IoT as small sensor nodes. These are now taking you into the device where you actually touch things. It is a device that is connected to the internet. It, it has a graphical user interface. It enables, or it's typically used with some user interaction, but it's also an native system. Um, okay, time's out. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions? One, one of the things, and I, I need to take this again, I took it, one of the slides, let's see, I think I have to, it, it would be a very rapid one. Yes. If you take this with you again, all of you who are doing harder design, uh, as you know, you should always have pull-up resistors or pull-down resistors. You should never have loading inputs to a processor. That's bad. 100 kilo ohm pull-up resistor. If the software is doing the wrong thing, if you drive this pin low with a pull-up resistor, and this is typically 2.5 volt system, uh, system power, you consume 62.5 milliwatt, oh, I'm sorry, microwatt. And if you calculate that over 24 hours or over one year, 
that would be 548 milliwatt hour, which is much more than a CR2025 lithium battery has because the capacity of that one is 425 milliwatt hour. So one single pull-up resistor, if the software is doing wrong with this pin, are wasting the whole battery, more than one battery. And then you have no, no processing done. It's just a pull-up resistor. And you have like 100 pull-up resistors in the device. So again, uh, this is kind of, I'm messing now because this is so important. There are so many poor designs. The, the hardware is okay, but the software was made faulty. It just didn't care about all these ports. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> so to our next speaker, okay. who is replacing Banya, who is also sick. Okay. So this is pretty yeah. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for this song. Vanya was the founder of Koitec. She cannot join today because of sickness. And I myself am not that technical, so I, I, I will present at a broader level. And I would definitely try to answer some of your questions. And uh, luckily, I had Hokan here who opened the way for a lot of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, a little bit about Koitec. Uh, Koitec is a company which was founded in 2017. It's actually um, a spin-off from Sony Mobile, and uh, we are really proud to say we are a completely Swedish company with manufacturing also in Sweden. And our DNA is really from Sony time to look at how do we optimize mobile devices, battery power consumption in wireless networks. And we have taken that technology and that, uh, that knowledge to transfer it to IoT. So we are really passionate about that area. So today I'm gonna to discuss one part of uh, this area, and in, in some ways it's uh, connecting to what uh, Hogan discussed. So, <coughs> we don't live in an ideal world, but so what, why does my data sheets? So, uh, <coughs> in the real world, uh, you know, with many, many connected devices, uh, they <coughs> operate in ways which vary significantly often to what they're advertised on. And uh, as engineers, um, we tend to accept this and uh, we just design it accordingly. But now as we are like moving into this perfection of the connected world, um, uh, this is really not enough. So we really need to understand beyond uh, we, we might have an ambition, for instance, that the connected device should be at the edge of the network and be there for several years and maybe just on a single primary cell. That's, that, let's say that's the ambition which a lot of us have. And how do we achieve this? Um, so we really need to go beyond the data sheets and really start understanding some things like, as Hokan said, where is the power consumption? and have that as an ambition for, uh, for our uh, a long battery life. So, um, uh, one such case is power so uh, energy sourcing of IoT. <coughs> and um, for most of it, we uh, look at batteries uh, as that case for power. But we should also look at alternatives like, uh, like energy harvesting and like Happy Shine is not here, but also for solar cells. Uh, regardlessly of all of these areas, we, we typically tend to follow the same approach of estimation when it comes to uh, uh, power budgeting. And that is this formula, uh, which is battery lifetime equal to nominal battery capaci divided, capacity divided by average current. Now, from user perspective, it's really easy to use this, but there are a few faults or a few, uh, let's say, uh, things which I'm going to highlight why this formula is not the best. First of all, um, 
the battery would typically be have uh, less capacity and the nominal battery uh, battery capacity stated in the data sheet and that has to do with the internal leakage of the current or and, and the internal resistance the second thing could be that uh, there's a cutoff uh, for your specific device you know there will be some dead capacity you will leave of the battery because it will not operate under a certain voltage and that's why this again could fail and one other aspect which Hokan talked a lot about today uh, is temperature. So uh, the nominal uh, battery capacity which you might see in the data sheet is based on the nominal temperature. But while your use case might have a higher or lower temperature and that can significantly impact the battery life. So uh, let's look at an example here. Uh, so we are looking here at, uh, sorry, so we're looking here at a battery, uh, I think it's 20, 42, 45, uh, sorry, just, uh, yeah, 24, CR 20, uh, 2450. Yeah, so when we calculate this uh, on an average basis, uh, and for this specific use case, which we are gonna see uh, some more slides, the average is, uh, average current is 20, uh, microamperes, and this gives us a lifetime of 3.4 years. But um, let's dive down a bit more in this area. And uh, so, with our product, Ulti, we have actually done some profiling of batteries. And uh, so, here you can see two different battery types uh, one which we call a good battery, and the other one which is not a good battery. So, uh, uh, batteries are chemical components, so they they can vary depending on the usage and so on. So this case illustrates really that what you might have thought would be the same for all batteries is not the same. Uh, this one sharp goes sharply down, and this one does not. But now let's see this how this impacts in our specific use case. So uh, in our specific use case, uh, the cutoff voltage is one point eight. Well, uh, volts and after that the device stops working so really what you're doing here is you are uh, actually having a lot of dead capacity especially in this battery where you're not able to use fully what the battery data sheet might have said and uh, if we put this together and come back to the calculations so what you might have thought that uh, the battery would be around 3.4 years actually might just be 2.6 or most likely even less. So as you see, this is really when people say uh, <coughs> battery, they have a 20 years battery, it's really not there. We have seen so many such cases uh, in our uh, small, uh, let's say, in, in, for instance, we were at an um, event and <coughs> the, the, the person at the event who had the census, they said 14 years, and we tested it, and we really could show it was less than three years. Mm. So uh, you really need to question when somebody <coughs> says 20 years, is it really 20 years? Because if it's based on the data sheet, it's not. So, uh, so the theory is we need to really go from estimation to data, and uh, I'd like to highlight a specific uh, uh, client of ours. <coughs> Their name is Bintel. And uh, they are in the Agritech Agri IoT. And actually they are neighbors to us, so that's, uh, so for us it was very easy to work with them also. So uh, they had, um, for their device, they had chosen uh, a battery specific supplier. And according to the data sheet, it showed that they could use this battery uh, for 27,000 transactions in that specific use case. Um, and luckily for us and luckily for them, they thought, well, let's see if this is really uh, what it is. And uh, so they took our product and used our OT toolbox, battery toolbox, and profiled a few batteries. And what it really showed was that the battery that chosen could just manage up to 10,000 transactions. So imagine if they had gone along as per the data sheet and deployed it in the field, it could be a disaster in the sense of both money and time. So, uh, so they actually changed the supplier. 
So that is one use case which I'd like to highlight. Um, the second is, uh, this is an interesting uh, study we did ourselves. We actually took seven, it's hard to see here, but they are like different kind of battery uh, manufacturers, everything from Duracell, Energy, Energizer, GP, Maruta, and so on, Murata, and so on. And uh, we, we profiled this for specifically for LoRaWAN, and um, it, it is a, for a specific use case. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, what we found was uh, there's a huge variation. So uh, this is the, the worst battery in the sense that it kind of dies out. Uh, the resistance of the battery increases fairly fast. So uh, what this is really showing, uh, reflecting back a bit to what Hoka also mentioned, in order to decide your battery, you really need to look at the application. You need to understand your product. Uh, you need to look at the form factor. If the form factor is small, will this battery manage what you're looking for? So there's so many different variants. So just going by the data sheet won't help you. Now, I'd like to uh, kind of highlight where we come in in this whole area. So this is the product we have, uh, like we are very proud of. It's called OT and we, and it's both a voltage source and a, uh, and a current sink. So you can use it as a power box. You connect your device and the test. You take out the battery. And then while this gives power, it will actually measure the power. But the other thing which we have been talking today about is you can connect a battery here. And once you connect the battery, um, you, can, um, load, you can load the battery as per your use case. So for instance, if you have a use case which has a certain profile of energy consumption, you can load it here, and you can also load it in that environment. So maybe you might have the battery in a chamber, which is cold and so on, so you can get much more realistic value. So when you do uh, the battery profiling, it looks like this. So here is for a, a, a specific battery, where we do a high and a low, we kind of go up and down, we drain the battery using this. And what you see here is the voltage drainage, uh, also, um, uh, the voltage curve, how it's kind of going down. Um, so uh, this this curve, we can then record it and store it. And then once this is done, we can actually play it back. So now we know the battery profile for this specific use case which we are going to use. And I can then uh, use this uh, battery profile. It's very hard to see, I think, that, uh, uh, over there in the end. But I can then replay the battery curve, the discharge curve, and I can use it back to my device and the test. And here I can now uh, step here in this curve and see how my, uh, my uh, product is reacting. And this helps me to optimize further on both the software. I think what Hokan said is very important, basically. And this is also one of the reasons our product, we have made it short, so so easy for software engineers to understand quickly. So what you can see here is maybe the debug log from your software, and you can correlate this debug log with your spike here, and you can zoom in and out. And then you can also, as you step here, you can see where this will fail, and you continuously iterate to improve this. So this is the theory we have, like uh, where you basically use uh, the profiling of a real use case usage play it back to your device and start improving the energy um, uh, optimization for your product. So uh, that is in a nutshell one of the use cases we, are, we wanted to discuss today. Uh, and uh, if you have more questions, let us know. And for any more tech, we would really love to do a, a demo presentation. It just takes an hour, half an hour. Just mail me and we'll set it up. Um, and. Uh, if you like, you can. Uh, you, yeah, that's that's really uh, that's all for me. For now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I have some really odd questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Any any questions? No? Yes. Yeah. So so do you have like a list of uh, uh, the number of backers you've already done profiling? Yeah, actually, we have done quite a few uh, of these and. Uh, 
once you buy, so we have actually in our product portfolio, this is the standard module. Uh, it does not have the battery profiling and emulation. Then we have the next level, which is a software on top. You can buy it on DGT, for instance, uh, which has the GUI part of the battery profiling. And the last is uh, enterprise solution, where we have both the scripting, you can script and automate completely using Python and so on. And uh, for the, uh, if you require some of the profiles which we have created, you just let us know and we'll send it to you. And we are also creating a, a GitHub where all of these will be available. But these are very specific to certain use cases we have been doing. So you have to actually, to really make sure the right, you have the right profile, you should profile it yourself and we can help you with it. Any more questions? Brilliant. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.